I'd like to begin by thanking Renit Yurosky, not for roping me into this, <laughs> but for recognizing that despite the generational difference, we could be friends. I would like I would like to thank Carmela Egan for modeling wisdom and for showing us all that a woman could be learned and wise. And I would like to thank Ron Egan, Zichrono Livracha, for helping me and showing me how to build a bar bat mitzvah program all that many decades ago when we worked together, when I was working at the Y, and we built a program together. I'd like to begin my narrative many, many decades ago, ancient history, in 1964. I was in my second year of university, and I was bored. So I quit school, and I registered in Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School. I lasted two days. <laughs> I ran back to university, re-registered, and took two classes, a philosophy class. I sat right there in the first row. The professor looked at me on the first day of class and said, Women are good for one thing. Don't open your mouth. I don't want to hear from you. I came back to university for this. My second class, I fell in love. It was anthropology. I've never lost that love. It taught me about human diversity, and I loved it. It fed my soul and my spirituality in ways I had never learned before. It taught me that human beings could be different and wonderful, that culture was diverse and rich and beautiful, and we all had our own heritage. We all fed our souls differently. We all ate differently, and that was wonderful. I loved it. So 1964, I grew. I actually was born, and I fell in love twice, first in anthropology, and second, I met the man of my dreams. I met Howard Joseph. And sitting in a cafe in Venice, I sat across from him and I said, Howard, I feel so sorry for you. And he said, why? And I said, no decent Jewish girl would ever marry a rabbi. <laughs> he said my fate was sealed that day. <laughs> my whole family were rabbis. I knew how awful it was to be a rabbi. I never wanted to be a rabbi, but my fate was sealed. When I came home and told my mother I met this guy, she said, but Norma, he's a rabbi. <laughs> and so I began to learn about the diversity of the world and the diversity of Jews. I loved learning. I'll jump a decade to 1974-75. By then, I'd already immigrated to Canada. I left Brooklyn. The accent never left me. <laughs> One of the students wrote on Rate, my professor, I learned so much, but the voice, who could listen to her? <laughs> I don't know, Afra, was it so bad? 1974-75, I'm giving a talk 
in the then Sadie Bronfman Center. For me, it was a purely academic talk. I'd been studying a lot about Judaism, and I'd come across this, for me, theoretical anomaly. How can Judaism claim Tzedek Tzedek Tirdov, seek justice passionately, when there was this problem in Jewish divorce? For me, it was theoretical. I hadn't yet met real people. <laughs> so I give this talk, I'm very la-di-da. At the end of the talk, there's a lineup of people. I think they're coming to congratulate me. <laughs> and they say, Norma, we're it. What do you mean you're it? Well, what are you going to do for us? What do you mean, what am I going to do for you? We're agunot. We're women who can't get a divorce. And so became and began my passion, my activism. I had little kids. I thought I was just going to be a married rabbi's wife. That decade had been a strange decade for me, that first decade coming here. I had lost my PhD. The university I went to in New York had dropped me like a stone off the wall. I had been a National Science Foundation fellow, done wonderful, given them the first 100 pages and asked for a six-month leave to finish because I had been working and had children, and they wrote back to me in their sexism, having children and having to work is not an excuse for not finishing on time. I swore I'd never go back to school. So I was just going to have children and be a wife. Finished. But I was also at the Spanish and Portuguese a wonderful synagogue that taught me I had already learned about human diversity. I didn't know anything about Jewish diversity. Here I was now learning about Jewish diversity. There were all different kinds of Jews. They didn't all eat gefilte fish. <laughs> they didn't even like it. <laughs> it was a wonderful different world of different kinds of Jews, Jews from Iraq and Morocco and Libya, and Syria, and Lebanon, Jews who ate differently, and talked differently, and thought differently, and practiced differently, or didn't practice, <laughs> but proud Jews. I was loving it. And I was thinking about Judaism very theoretically. And now I learned that Jewish law and practice had real consequences in people's lives. And so I started thinking about real life people. Diversity wasn't theoretical. Judaism didn't live up in the clouds. And I couldn't walk away from people's agony. I had to care. More than that, I had to do something. So I got active. Active enough so that at a certain point, my youngest son, one night, didn't do his homework. And he came to me. The assignment was due the next morning. And I said, Naf, why? You have your assignment due this morning, the next morning. Why didn't you do it? He said, Ma, come and help me. I said, I can't help you at the last minute. And he looked at me and he said, Ma, if I were an aguna, you'd drop everything to help her. <laughs> I dropped everything to help him. <laughs> so in 1985, the next decade, by then I was working with Evelyn and Marcia and Diane. We went to the Attorney General of Quebec. We had a meeting. The men tried to stop us. The night before our meeting with the Attorney General, they said, Norma, they called me. 
Norman, you can't go. Why not? Well, you don't represent the Jewish community. I said, okay, I won't represent you. I'll represent us. Now you can't go. I said, yes, I can. No, you can't. My husband whispered in my ear, you can go. <laughs> so we went to the Attorney General to ask him to help us create a law, a civil law, that would help Jewish women level the playing field. We knew we, it wouldn't fix Jewish law. We knew the problem for women was in Jewish law. We knew we had to work on Jewish law. But we also knew women needed help right now. And when you're faced with a woman who needs help right now, you do whatever you can right now. You work on the long-term law right now. And we knew that the Canadian government, the Quebec government, was easier move than the rabbis. <laughs> and let me paraphrase that more carefully, the orthodox rabbis. With Lisa, I could have worked right away. <laughs> So we went to the Attorney General, who at that point, the Quebec Attorney General, was Herb Marks. I thought this was going to work easier, right? No, Herb looked at me and said, Norma, you don't want me to do anything. I said, what do you mean, Herb? Of course I want you to do something right now. He said, no, you don't. Now, truth to be told, what was this little Brooklyn girl telling somebody, a Quebec government official, he said, you don't want me to do anything because you don't want it in Quebec. You want a Canadian national amendment, right? Divorce is national. What good is a Quebec amendment going to do for you? It, divorce is national. This will only go into family court. It won't help. And it won't help PEI. And it won't help BC. What good is it? Go national. And I said, but Herb, it'll take us forever. It's 1985. He said, go national. So that was 1985. Something else happened in 1985, because we're trying to, I'm trying to tell you the good, the bad, and the in-between. 1985, a couple of other things happened, because my story is not a one-track story. In 1985, right at the beginning, a rabbi in Toronto wrote a column. Norma Joseph and Blue Greenberg are Jezebels. I, I actually had to go back into the Bible and read the whole story to figure out <laughs> what he was accusing me of. Now, if a rabbi accuses you of something, is it such a big deal? It's not, you know, what's a big deal? I was very insulted, but the really big deal was that the Globe and Mail thought this was wonderful news, and they printed his entire sermon in the Globe and Mail. Then they called me and said, you want to write a response? <laughs> I said, no, I won't honor him with a public response, but do you know why he wrote that about me? Well, the reporter said, he must have heard you speak. I said, no, he never heard me speak. He never read anything I wrote. He never spoke to me. He doesn't even know me. And the reporter said, nonsense. Of course he heard you speak or read something you said. I said, you go call him back. You ask him. An hour later, the reporter wrote, called me back and said, you know, he doesn't know you. He never read you. He never spoke to you. I find that amazing. I said, I don't find it amazing. I find it amazing you're a lousy reporter. <laughs> so I was at first very upset. And then I said to myself, oh, this rabbi, Shochet is his name. Shochet means he's a slaughterer. <laughs> he did me a big favor. I didn't even know half the favor. The first favor I figured is now I have a Purim costume. <laughs> I can dress as Jezebel every year. <laughs> but the bigger favor he did me, I was on my way to Israel for the first international, 
first international conference of Jewish feminism. But I, I had a, a, a big job. I was going to Israel to begin to interview women who would be in the film Half the Kingdom. Now, you may not believe me, but at that point in my life, I was extraordinarily shy. <laughs> and I had a cold call, some very famous women like Alice Shalvey and some members of parliament to interview them on the phone, and I was very afraid to call them. I actually was going to ask other people to make the call. I was really shy. But I had a courage, and I picked up the phone, and I called Alice Shalvey, and I said, Alice Shalvey, this is Norma Joseph, and I had a whole spiel ready, and she said, Norma Joseph, are you Jezebel? <laughs> so he opened the way for me. So that was 1985. But 1985, because we were at this conference, this first international conference, was one other thing. It was the year at that conference that my very good friend Rivka Haut, Zichronola Fracha, leaned over to me while we were davening in the morning, on a Tuesday morning. We were an all-women's group praying. She leaned over and she said, Norma, on Thursday we have to read the Torah. And I thought she was going to ask me who's ready to read the Parsha. But instead she said, Norma, why don't we go to the Kotel? And that was the beginning of Women of the Wall. So 1985 was a very big year for my social activism. It was the beginning of our going to parliament. It was the beginning of Women of the Wall. I now no longer belong to Women of the Wall because I disagree with Anat Hoffman. I belong to Nashim Bitvila Bakotel, the women who insist that we do pray at the Kotel and not at, women, at the um, Robinson's Arch, which Anat is willing to go to. I'm still working for Agunot, still with Marsha, Evelyn, Diane. We're still trying to get freedom, but we did incredibly within five years get a bill in this wonderful government of Canada of ours, get 21.1, a bill which helps Agunot through the civil divorce process even out the playing field. It doesn't get a get immediately, but it helps them in a wonderful series of ways, better than anything in the States, better than anything in Israel. We've managed to accomplish a lot. So by 1990, we had civil legislation in incredible ways. My life has been enriched by the people I've been able to work with. I stand in front of you 2017, a grandmother of 12 wonderful grandchildren. I have my PhD. I did go back to school eventually. I married still to the same man I was married. I was never divorced. I'm not the child of divorced people. I became an activist for divorce because I truly believe I truly believe that Judaism has to be a place of tzedek, tzedek, tirdov, of justice passionately pursued by everybody, for everybody, for Jews, for non-Jews, for everybody. I am a proud Canadian. I am a worried American. <laughs> I am a strong Zionist. I just came just now from a baby naming ceremony for a girl, something we wouldn't have done in 1964, but something we do naturally and across all denominations, all borders now, easily, recognizably, with an ancient ceremony that we forgot about. For every child, we should welcome them, make them happy, make them proud. I am proud to be a Jew, to be a feminist, 
to be a scholar. It took me a long time to take that title, to own it. I am proud. I'm happy to be here. I hope you're happy. Thank you.